Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. On this episode, we highlight two very important events taking place from April 18th to the 24th. National Volunteer Week is an opportunity for the Kidney Foundation to recognize the passion, the commitment, the expertise, and the generosity of thousands of Kidney Foundation volunteers who help provide kidney patients with invaluable comfort and support each and every day. And not DAW, National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week takes place from the 18th to the 24th and celebrates organ and tissue donation and raises awareness about the critical need for more organ donors across Canada. To highlight this vital need, Alexis and Rob are back to share with us the journey they're currently on in search of a living kidney donor for Alexis. They talk about some of the challenges and silver linings they've experienced along the way. This is an episode you don't want to miss, so stay with us because it's all coming up next right here on Kidney Plugged In. A self-described extrovert, Alexis has spent most of her life being active and in great health. And in 2018, she was on top of the world, having just married the love of her life, Rob. Wanting to start a family right away, they were overjoyed when Alexis became pregnant just a few months after they were married. However, about five months into the pregnancy, on a routine visit to the doctor, they discovered protein in her urine and further investigative tests led to the diagnosis that Alexis had IgA nephropathy. The news came as a complete shock to Alexis, who had had no real symptoms and had no family history of kidney disease but she delivered the baby safely to term and they had a healthy little baby boy named Kate. Knowing that one day she would need a kidney transplant, Alexis and Rob desperately wanted to have a second child. So with careful consideration and working with Alexis's doctors, they were once again over the moon when Alexis became pregnant with baby number two. So in December of 2020, Alexis and Rob welcomed a beautiful baby girl named Sloan. Unfortunately, what they could not have been prepared for was the dramatic downturn in Alexis's kidney health that followed Sloan's birth. And the path that this would put them on towards a search for a living kidney donor match for Alexis. Alexis, if we can go back for a moment to St. Paul's Hospital, directly after you gave birth to Sloan, uh, you were placed on dialysis at that time. Did that mean that they were able to stabilize you? No, I was fortunate that I didn't need dialysis. I was, we actually didn't realize it at the time what my labs actually were. And I think we found out maybe three weeks later um, that my labs were, you know, basically I was on the verge of kidney failure and um, the conversation had been brought up that that was sort of the next step for me. Um, fortunately, my health improved a little bit. It's also it's a funny thing to say when you're at the end stage of a kidney disease that I'm saying my health improved. Um, it, <laughs> it improved to a level where I didn't need dialysis right away. So we're very thankful for that. It didn't improve to a point where I'm never going to need it. Um, I'm definitely looking down the hall at it. And that's why we're so actively looking for a donor. Oh, so that kind of conversation that you had with your healthcare team, um, that's the route for you now. Um, yeah, like you need a kidney transplant? Yes, yeah, I need a transplant. And the hope is that I avoid dialysis. Dialysis is tough on people at the best of times. I think being a young mom with two kids, kids, kids don't sleep through the night. <laughs> so, you know, even if I could do dialysis at home, um, it's just putting another weight on Rob and Rob's carrying 
99.9% of the weight right now. So <laughs> if we can be successful in finding a donor and get me a transplant as soon as possible and avoid dialysis, that would be a dream come true for, for us for sure. So let's talk a little about this. This conversation would have put you on the path to look for a living kidney donor. Um, how did you begin that process? Um, yeah, the doctor had suggested to us that um, it was, not even suggested, told us that it was uh, up to us to be our own advocates in finding a living donor. The process to find a living donor and the donor clinic is all very private. So we had to voice ourselves in a way that was presenting our story, but also educating everybody on what this actually meant uh, for them and for us. I think we started with, you know, our immediate family knew what was going on. And then uh, we figured it would just be easier to write a letter and explain ourselves in one place and the same story so that everyone really understood what was going on um, and the message was clear. So Rob and I started our donor reach out by sending a letter to close friends and family, just sort of explaining the situation and what we're going through currently. I think it really came as a shock to a lot of people that we were in this position because we just haven't seen everybody and it's not an easy conversation to bring up. When we found ourselves, you know, coming out of the kidney clinic and with the news that we really need to go out and find uh, a compatible um, kidney donor, we were kind of at a loss where to start and through the conversations with uh, the support team through St. Paul's, they gave us a number of ideas and avenues that we kind of just adopted and, and tried to make our own. Certainly it was one of the tougher letters that we'd ever had to write. We went through a number of iterations and, and frankly, it's never gonna be perfect because unfortunately it scared a lot of close family and friends. And it wasn't our intent to scare people. It's just nobody quite knew the circumstances in which we'd been living in recent months. And it, and it was a way of opening up that line of communication. We were fortunate enough to get some media attention through local media, and that's really spread the word. And it's been absolutely incredible. Um, the amount of people who have reached out just to check in or send food or um, just send good thoughts to us, it's been unbelievable. Hey honey, I lost the list for Jason's birthday thing. Obviously hamburger cakes. <laughs> no, not hamburger cakes. Hamburgers and cake. <laughs> <laughs> and buns, uh, sausage. Talking. Ooh, eye candy. Is it a full moon tonight? People are being weird. And uh, don't forget to make the Facebook event private this time. Okay, bye. <gasps> Can you imagine losing most of something without realizing it? Over time, kidney disease can destroy up to 80% of kidney function before you notice any symptoms. Talk to your family doctor to see if you're at risk and need to be screened. It could save your life. Alexis and Rob, we were just talking about how the letter that you wrote really informed your family and friends about your situation. And after that, they really rallied around you to provide support in whatever way they could. And that included probably for some of them, maybe checking to see if they were a possible living donor match. And that was the idea of getting the letter out, right? Was to get the word out to as many people as possible. 
Yeah, it's definitely um, a power in numbers thing, trying to find a kidney donor. The statistics are terrible with <laughs> so have a, the success rate of finding a donor um, is quite low. So the more people that come forward to try, the better the odds are. And our fingers are just crossed that we have the right odds in our favor. Yeah. Uh, even though you mentioned that this letter was sent to your family and friends, it still had to be a difficult ask. In life, it's it's hard to ask for things in general. It's hard to ask for help, um, whether that be like, can you grab me some milk from the grocery store? Because I have two kids hanging off me and I don't have the opportunity to do it myself. Um, but when you're asking for a vital organ, um, it just takes it to a whole other level of asking for help. But it's so important to ask for help because you need it. People want to help, but they don't know until you ask. And so I think it was really important for us to unfortunately scare and upset a lot of people, but um, that was the reality. I, I can imagine that this has been a huge learning curve for both of you and, and continues to be. Um, looking back, any reflections on your journey so far? Um, reflecting on it now, we were surrounded by inspiration. We've been very fortunate. Our next door neighbor gave her sister-in-law a kidney not too long ago. And so we were able to um, use her as a support, not only on those dark days, but also ideas on how best to approach family and friends and let them know about the supportive, safe, healthy process that's available. Our good friends just up the street, um, um, she, um, gave her father a kidney um, not too long ago and then proceeded to have two beautiful children since then with one kidney. So we, we benefited from having, you know, this within our circles and so we've been able to share those stories a little bit more but, uh, better than I think we would have otherwise. And Alexis, what are some of the things that are most important to you that you've learned along the way? First and foremost, I think we've really learned that, um, that we're loved. Um, <laughs> definitely felt a lot of love from, and I think, I think, I hope most people are loved, but I think these things really make you feel loved and have people show you that they love you. It's not often in life that you're given such a real situation that is like life and death and also um, a, a disease and an issue that does have a solution. It's hard to manage the thoughts of what the future is for me and when. Um, but I think uh, going through this journey, Rob and I know that um, we're here for each other. You know, it certainly has made us stronger. We've been at our breaking point countless times um, over the past year specifically. Sometimes we feel completely alone, especially because of COVID and the, the, last, uh, the lack of human connection and, and, and personal connection. But other times in the most recent weeks, when we made that really difficult decision to kind of go semi-public and share our story, we've never felt so supported. Friends and family um, that we haven't seen um, because we're all busy or because of other circumstances have, have, have just, you know, come out and, and and showed us so much love, um, given us hope that there is a pathway um, for Ali and for our family to move forward together. Um, and, and it's really that positive energy, the positive vibes that is keeping us going. The fact is, is that um, a good friend of Alexis has forwarded on our story to a, a local outlet and, and asked us if we'd be comfortable sharing. And we said, after a long conversation, yes, we think this is the appropriate time. And we have we've just been overwhelmed with positive um, uh, support since then. And it gives us hope that, um, that people are coming forward, not only interested in supporting Ali, but in supporting others that are just as much in need. As tough as it must have been for you both to write this letter, um, I think it also helps others in the same situation. When they see what you're doing, how to be a self advocate um, if they're looking for a kidney donor, you know, that's a big help. Because I think in general, people don't want to share bad news. They don't want to share that they're sick. They don't want to look weak. But 
we bit the bullet and we exposed ourselves and what we were going through. And I think there's a level of relief that's associated with it. Um, I feel, I certainly feel freed of what I'm going through because I've shared. Please stay with us because Alexis and Rob will be back a little later in the show to talk more about their journey and their search for a living donor. Well, Rob, you've actually begun the process of being tested to see if you could be a living donor kidney match for Alexis. Um, can you share with us what was involved in making the decision to start down that path? Through finding out that uh, Ali had kidney disease a couple of years ago, going through two pregnancies, I felt largely on the sidelines. I'm playing a supportive role, doing my best um, to support um, the champion of our family. Um, she's the glue that keeps our little family together, our community together. And so Ali did a valiant effort in getting as far as she possibly did. She brought her healthy little girl into the world just before Christmas, and ultimately it all caught up with her and kind of hit the wall right around Christmas time. I see it as an opportunity for myself and others to step up and to carry on what Ali was trying to do all along, and that was to support and grow our family. So if there's anything I can possibly do to potentially become a donor is inconsequential. It's, it's a no-brainer. So it, it didn't take a lot of thought. I think I actually even did it without telling Alexis um, that I went and got my own blood checked. And so that was one of the first things we did um, when we got home, when we got Allie back home and I got some time to myself was checked in with Life Labs and um, I'm now going through that process and gaining confidence in the rigor and the thoroughness of the screening process. It's not easy. Um, they, they are really trying to find the best possible match um, to ensure that Allie can continue on to live a healthy and long life. They also want to make sure that the donor has an equal, if not better, chance of having a long, successful, thriving life going forward. And so they're not going to pick a donor that doesn't have everything going for him or her to allow them to succeed. Yeah, Rob, we were actually talking earlier and you were saying that it was very important for you to go through the testing process to be a living kidney donor. Um, can you tell us why? It was very important to me um, to be the first one to get tested. 
um, despite high likelihood that I will not end up being a successful match um, to give Ali my kidney. It was really important for me to know the process before I could you know, go ask a friend or family to consider going through this process that I knew it myself. And I'd never ask somebody to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. And so going through that process and seeing it from not only you know, being a partner of a potential recipient to a potential donor, it's given me great confidence that they built in um, a, a confidential, private, rigorous, comprehensive process that really looks out for both the donor's best interest, but also the recipient's. And at times it's, it's frustrating on the recipient end because you're not getting any information on if, if your angel has arrived quite yet, but it's all there to protect the integrity of the process and the confidentiality of the donor. The donor is able to, to step out and exclude themselves from the process at any time. They also need to be prepared um, that uh, of the disappointment of maybe going through the process and finding out that they're not a match themselves. So there's a lot of, um, of, a lot of effort and time spent putting into managing expectations, but also most importantly, managing the best health outcomes for both parties. Please stay with us because Alexis and Rob will be back a little later in the show to talk more about their journey and their search for a living donor. Hi, Kidney March family. My name is Joyce Van Jersen and I'm the executive director of the Southern Alberta branch and the Saskatchewan branch of the Kidney Foundation of Canada. And I'm here with my colleague, Laura Fleming, the incredible uh, manager of Kidney March and signature events for us. So we wanted you guys to be the very first to know. Kidney March 2021 is going virtual. You know, in a minute, Laura is gonna provide you with some of those details. You know, but know this, your health and safety is always, as forever been, our number one priority. So this is our virtual edition of Kidney March. And what's cool about that is Kidney March this year is gonna allow you to participate no matter where you are, no matter what continent, what country, or where in the country you are. We want you to join our incredible Kidney March family from any place. You know, last year, you guys proved nothing stops Kidney March. You exceeded beyond every expectation we had. Kidney patients and people on the transplant waiting list need you. They need all of us. Whatever challenges this year might bring, whatever opportunities it brings, we march no matter what. Now here's Laura with some of the details for Kidney March 2021. We have a suggested minimum distance to keep you safe, but get creative in how you complete your journey, always keeping your safety first. We were so inspired and amazed at the beautiful routes, the fun home camps, crew cheer, and innovative fundraising last year. We have lots of surprises up our sleeve this year to keep our community connected, having fun, and doing the most we possibly can in our fight against kidney disease and for organ donation. Now a word about teams. Think big, you guys. Recruit your team far and wide. Let your imagination run wild. You know, we've had marchers from all across Canada, including the Yukon, Europe, the US, and even New Zealand. So there's no limitation to who could be on your kidney march team. Let's see how far we can really go this year. Let's challenge ourselves. Kidney March is a community of support. We will stay connected, marching and cheering each other on through our social pages, training walk groups, and on Strava. Be sure to join the conversations and share your experiences. We want to hear from you and see where your training, fundraising, and marching takes you. We march no matter what. Let's see, so kidney is a... These are my grandpa's kidney stones. They're very precious. Kidney is a bone in your back that helps you turn. <laughs> mm, I don't know, to be honest. They don't know kidneys are vital, do you? Get the facts at kidney.ca.
Alexis and Rob, you know, where do things stand right now for you? Where are we now? Um, so we're just in the, the holding pattern of hurry up and wait for test results. And the hard part is not knowing um, how many people have come forward where they're at in the process. If we have any good potential matches, we just don't know. And it's just a test of your own will of just being able to like, let something go and like, let the, let the universe take it from here. Because personally, being a bit of a control freak, um, <laughs> I'm sure getting my life's lesson, I literally can't control anything. I can't control my kidney disease and I can't control finding a donor. Let alone our two-year-old son. And a two-year-old, so. <laughs> <laughs> But considering everything that's in front of us and behind us and on top of us, we're just taking it day by day and uh, trying to do it with our chins up and our hearts full and just trying to stay positive. We're doing our best to support each other, so enjoy our time with our two young kids. hold out some hope that in the not too distant future, we might receive some positive news. control of when I find and meet Rob, find the love of my life. Uh, I thought that was hard enough. And now <laughs> I'm on a whole other level. It's definitely a life lesson, so. And that's the great thing about having young kids. Just, just the moment that you're kind of stuck in your own wallow for all of 30 seconds, the kid dumps something over. So you're just trying to get back at it, right? You just don't have, a, you don't have an opportunity to think about it too much.